I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome back to GEOS 1000 Dynamic Earth. And in this one, I'm going to introduce you to fossils. Earlier in the term, you already saw chapters 7 and 8 in the book, dealing with geologic time and with geologic or Earth history, respectively. And we're going to be calling back a little bit to that stuff in this section, because this section talks about fossils and fossilization of ancient life. Part of the aspect of Earth's being dynamic and changing over time is that life itself changes over time. The earliest days of geology as a discipline came about because of engineers and canal diggers finding out that certain rocks with certain fossils in them were found in a particular sequence and never out of sequence. The beginnings of the understanding of stratigraphy, biostratigraphy, looking at the layering of rocks and pinning what layer are you looking at based upon the fossil content, which we know today is the record of ancient life that used to live when the environment in that spot was very different millions of years ago. What I'm sitting on right here is a big piece of limestone. And this one is probably from Kentucky, uh, age probably about middle to lower Carboniferous. And you can see that this used to be part of a coral reef. What I'm sitting on used to be uh, loose lime sand, calcium carbonate sand, a sunlit, warm, tropical lagoon environment, probably, or coastal environment. In this particular piece, I'm looking at individual rugos coral animals. Let's take a look at this piece. If you were standing here, the first thing you'd notice probably is what looks like geodes, or little bugs in the rock. And that's basically what they are. Originally, when this was compressing into sedimentary rock from loose lime sediment, uh, eventually, if that was a little piece of organic matter or just a more soluble piece of that stuff, it was going to dissolve out, leaving behind a bug that crystallizes into. And if that were to weather out intact, that's basically what a geode is. But what I really want you to see is this. This is an example of a rugos coral. It is a fossil that is still in the rock. It hasn't weathered completely out yet. You can see the top of the horn here, narrowing to here. And you can see vertical grooves, which is how it would grow in life. And you can see horizontal growth bands. It would grow from very small to get big as it got older. This one, we don't really know, but it was either a few years or maybe even a few decades old when it died. This was an individual coral, and you can see more in this. If you looked at this rock or something like it in field, here's another. A rugos coral weathered out of the rock part way. And that's the thing about fossils. If you see one, if you're a place where there are fossils, if you're a national park, leave it alone or take pictures only. But otherwise, if you don't collect it, it's going to be gone soon because they weather out and then they're gone. This is an ephemeral feature. It's why it's so important to study these things while we find examples. One more. Right immediately close to that piece is a piece of a bryozoan, a sea fan, bryozoan animal that would have waved in the water of the deep currents. And now it's embedded in rock. It looks like snakeskin, and as a child I'd see these things and think that's what it is. But it's actually a sea fan from a coral reef long gone. And this whole thing is decorated with bits of fossil that are poking out of the rock, or the rock is, is eroded to that point. If I look at this, I can look and I can see rugose corals, I can see bryozoan pieces, and it tells me what kind of environment it was. I can see bits of crinoid. So that pins when this rock was formed in time. And using other techniques, we can determine how old it is directly. So in an earlier lab, you looked at geologic time, the road trip across America, road trip through time. You also looked at radiometric chronology, geochronology. In this lab, we're going to be dealing with fossils specifically. Why, does, why do I deal with this so late in the term instead of earlier when I was talking about these, these chapters to begin with? Well, because we're coming back to them now because now you know what sedimentary rock is. If I had given it to you out of context, you probably wouldn't have understand as much. But now that you understand what sedimentary rock types exist, have gone through that part of the rock cycle, now you can sort of get an appreciation for the environment in which animals live, and plants, that can become preserved as a fossil in the rock. And so in this section of the course, for the fossils lab, 
I don't ask you to buy fossils as a fossil collection because I haven't seen many that are very good. Uh, fossils, you have to hunt for them individually, whereas if it's quartz, you just take a chunk of quartz and put it in a box. Uh, so it's harder to find uh, educational kits of fossils that are really worth buying. You have to go out there and kind of look for it yourself. I grew up in a part of this uh, country in Alabama where there was a whole lot of limestone around in caves and fossils were common. And so I, I developed an interest in this stuff pretty early in life. If you grow up around fossils and around rocks like this, often that's the result. So what I want you to get out of this part of the course is to understand how fossils are preserved, different modes of preservation, um, and in fact, what's a fossil and what isn't a fossil. And the fact that there are also trace fossils, footprints left in sediment and preserved are trace fossils. Worm burrows and sedimentary rocks showing where worms used to dig into the sediment to leave their traces behind. Feeding traces, the walking trail of a trilobite across sand or across lime mud on the seafloor. So I've also got a couple of videos that you should see. One is about just that, modes of preservation. Another one is about how to identify some common types of fossils. Types of things that you'll encounter if you look for fossils and what they signify about that time period. If you see this type of fossil, you know that you're in a particular time period. And that's why these things are very valuable. They give us glimpses into a day in the life in a very ancient time period where things were very different. And this was, if it came out of Kentucky, as I suspect it did, then this piece of limestone represents a place, a particular environment, very different from what that place is like now. This rock is not in its original position, but if you're sitting there looking at an outcrop, that used to be the bottom of the sea or that used to be a river channel, or that used to be desert sand dunes. And I think part of the appreciation of geology to me is being able to make those connections and think about rocks not as rocks, but as relics of a prior age. And what can they tell you if you look closely enough? So that's a brief introduction. Uh, you've already sort of been introduced to a deep time before, but I want you to make sure you pay attention, especially uh, dealing with chapter seven, dealing with modes of preservation, chapter eight, dealing with geologic time, especially from the Cambrian forward, because that's when you really start to get fossils telling us a lot about Earth's history. Before the Cambrian, there were no large seagoing animals that had hard parts that would leave preserved forms. The Ediacaran forms of the late Precambrian are all we have, and it's some very small fossils leading into when life would flourish with hard parts and with eyes and greater size, going through the Cambrian and onward forward into the Phanerozoic Eon. So that should get you started. Um, move on ahead, keep going, because the term will run out before you know it.